What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the chaos. My name is Vlad Tech, and today, reacting to some more laser pig. Why? Because you guys suggested it. I'm just gonna shift right on my chair for a bit. Don't mind me. I just like bounce out of frame for a bit. And today, we have a perfectly sober discussion on World War I French tanks. Now, it has come to my attention that Laser Pig is also very drunk when he records his videos. So, I don't know if he's actually going to be sober or if he's going to be more drunk than usual, but uh, let's figure it out. Ah, French tanks. Love them or hate them, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. They hate you more. Of course, I'm old enough to remember a time when the popular internet amateur historian didn't think France had any tanks, or thought they were all hopelessly outdated, and that's how Germany swept the floor with them in the Second World War. Uh yep. And hindsight, I kind of get it a little bit because, like, some of that was still going around when I was a kid. So that's been a stereotype for quite a bit. Oh, you sweet summer children. Of course, now everyone is super into the Sharpie 1 because it's god tier in various tank games. But what if I told you it has a bigger, meaner, more Frenchier, older sister who has a sort of mysterious oh. mystery of mystery which surrounds her? I mean, obviously, I'm talking about the Char 2C, but pretend you didn't know that, and I'll give you some sweets later. In um, I actually legitimately didn't know that. Can I get some sweets now? Laser Pig rants about French tanks for half an hour. Oh, that's gonna be a long one. During the First World War, a number of countries began experimenting with tracked armoured vehicles, later to be known as tanks, and France was no <laughs> exception. Developing armoured vehicles around the same time as Britain, their development fell unfortunately and very Frenchily behind. All tank projects were considered secret, and the development of one had largely been at the whim of one General Leon Marot. Now, Actual photo. He was aware the British were working on one, but neglected to give his own contractors, FCM, anything outside of a verbal communication on what to work on. So they did what all great French corporations do, accept huge payouts mm -hmm. from the government for contracts, and do absolutely nothing. Now that's my dream job right there. If I can just get paid to, like, do nothing and hold a baguette and a cigarette. Okay, maybe not the cigarette part, but, you know, just do nothing while holding a baguette. That right there would be my dream job. So the British get their tanks out first, and General Moreau is, quite frankly, pissed. He calls mm -hmm. the Brits and asks if France could have, or at least purchase, some Mark I tanks, to which he receives no reply. Huh. However, the French peasantry, now having witnessed this new British invention, become curious as to their own projects to develop such a vehicle. So politicians start poking at FCM and found that, well, they hadn't done anything. Imagine that. They hadn't done anything. So Moreau takes full control of the project, and he remembers that Louis Renault had previously approached the Ministry of Munitions with a design for a tracked mortar, which had been rejected. But running out of options, he begged Renault to work with FCM to build something, anything. And reluctantly, Renault agreed. And thus history was made. Uh, I think. I don't know. Then it gets really early in the story, so... Maybe he developed something that just made him explode? However, while FCM set about building this new heavy tank, Renault had secretly been working on his own tank project. Oh. And with this contract, he now had the resources to finally complete it. Renault wanted a lighter, okay. smaller tank which focused on mobility, but he wasn't blind to the idea of other tank types. In 1916, uh -huh. he conducted a feasibility study for a much heavier tank. And with oh. British tanks still getting stuck in the mud, he quickly realized, according to himself, that any future mm -hmm. heavy tank would need big, wide tracks, a well-built transport, mission and a powerful suspension. And thanks to the study, Renault was able to produce a wooden mock-up of a heavy tank, which featured none of these things. How are you going to test out an idea without actually making the idea? Doesn't seem like the smartest thing ever to do there. Presenting it to the French government as part of his joint effort with FCM. The tank would be one of the most advanced to date, capable of carrying multiple machine guns as well as a massively heavy 105mm artillery. The French were impressed, and they threw croissants at him. This new tank would be the most powerful and advanced weapon of war ever built. There was just one teeny, 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 tiny problem. Uh, we'll get that to in a second. Also, the croissant was actually from Austria. You know, there's your history fun fact for you. Also, that was cool. Can I see it again? We have the 105 millimeter <sighs> artillery. That is the satisfying. French were impressed. Look at it go. And they threw salt at him. I have no idea why, but I found that whole section satisfying. 
if you guys found it satisfying, let me know in the comments section down below. Also, while you're down there, check the description. If you're a member of the cult, pay your tithe over at Patreon, or send me an offering in the form of a super thanks. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Continuing. Brigadier Jean Baptiste Estine, who was oh, no. in charge of France's tank divisions, had been a key advisor on Renault's tanks project and had been sneakily listening in on everything going on. Okay, how's that a problem? He was in favor of returning to a war of mobility. He wanted those lighter tanks that Renault was building, and that was the problem. As oh, the okay. politicians and the public favored the bigger, heavier tanks. But because France oh. only had limited factories capable of producing tanks, there was a very good chance that these idiotic politicians would spend all of France's resources just building one massive tank. Estine didn't want this. So mm. one night, by the light of a tiny candle, he writes to the commander of the Allied forces, General Joffre. Women fear me, fish want... Uh, okay, that's pretty weird. Also... <laughs> Jesus. Well, you see, the thing is that, uh, when you have a bigger tank, it tends to last a whole lot longer. Lighter tanks, not so much. That's kind of the trade-off. Which one do you want? Of course, there's the production thing, but if you can produce that many tanks, I mean, you best be producing that many tanks. In which he writes the following. Hello, baby. These people are idiots. Please help me stop them. I've tried poking them with sticks, but they still insist. I need your strong and manly arms. Your dearest love, Jeanestine. Oh. Nah, well... Are you okay, Laser Pig? <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's not how it went down. Joffrey admitted that giant tanks could serve a purpose if used correctly. He ultimately sided with Estine, though he had no power to cancel the project. Instead, he pressed that the priority would be to get tanks into battle as quickly as possible. Hmm. And while the new heavy tank concept could take years to develop, Renault's new light tank was almost ready to be put in mass production. So a committee oh. was formed to discuss how tank development should proceed in France. Do we go for heavy tanks or do we go for the lighter tanks? But because it could have a tiny little nimble fecker running around and blasting things out and then just like just blast hit and run stuff type stuff and just zip around all the danger but could get destroyed in one hit or do i have the juggernaut <laughs> Before I could even decide on what entrees to serve at lunch, the French lost Bureaucrest, and with it, Romania. Already taking a heavy political flak for Verdun, Joffrey was forced out of office in favor of the far less sexy Robert Novel. Was it Robert? How'd you say Robert in French? Robert. Uh, Le Robert Nouvel. Perfectly sober discussion here. <laughs> Yeah. Now he had his own opinions on tanks, and after learning of this heavy tank project, he was absolutely horrified because it would take uh, resources away from his pet project, the Schneider CA. Oh boy. And so okay. began a chain of events that only could ever possibly happen in France. Well, if it's anything like the thing, the, uh, the, uh, set of events that happened with the Pyron. I guaranteed I just pronounced that wrong. The I am a poll reaction video, which, by the way, will be linked in a card, I guess. This could quite literally be one of the most awesome things I've ever seen. Or one of the worst. We'll find out. Resources being split into yet another tank project, General Moreau made a deeply tragic and somewhat unhinged political move. He'd uh -oh. support the Schneider tank project, but just to make everything fair, only if they split production with their main market rivals, the company de Forges Electric, the company Marine Forges and Steelworks of Home Car, which had been financially struggling because France's naval actions during the First World War were somewhat lackluster, and honestly, they didn't need more ships being built, which was kind of their shtick, you know? Uh, okay, well, uh, first off, this image. <laughs> that image is cursed. So I'm assuming the idea is they stop making ships and instead assist with helping create these tanks. I can't see where this is going to go wrong. So, Fam agrees to start building tanks, but Schneider refuses to share the tank blueprints unless Fam pays for the entire production run of the 400 tanks on order, which oh, they God. obviously refuse to do. So, to Moreau's horror, Fam start producing their own tank based on pictures they'd seen of the Schneider. With production oh, resources Christ. now split between four projects, Moreau's dream of a French super tank felt like a lost cause. With the veil at the helm, France's first tank was the Schneider and its market rival, the Saint-Chamond. Both were utterly useless. 
Well, that's sad. They could have had something great, but instead, um, they were too French. <laughs> My apologies, I couldn't help it. Because of the position of its gun, the Schneider can only shoot right. The space is so cramped that the crew struggle to breathe, and the entire tank is unventilated with the exhaust from the engine basically being pumped right into the face of the crew. In an effort to negate this problem, huh? Schneider supplied the crews of cigarettes to mask the smell of the engine fumes, essentially turning the tank into a fucking hotbox, which A, prevented the crew from being able to see anything, and B, making sure everyone else could see them via the thick trail of smoke cranking towards them. Ah. Uh. Imagine you operate a vehicle for work and it pumps its exhaust straight into the cabin. And to fix this problem, your boss just hands you cigarettes and says, just smoke enough so you can't smell it. That'll solve the problem. Do you have any idea the kind of lawsuit you would be facing? if you were the owner of that company. The St. Shimon didn't really fare much better. In an attempt to one-up Schneider, Pham attaches this gigantic 75mm field cannon to the front of it. The gun makes the tank so top-heavy, the second it tries to cross a trench, the whole tank belly flops into the mud and then buries itself. In oh, fact, cool. the St. Shimon is so bad, crews are refusing to get onto them in the training fields, prompting one of the main training instructors to write to General Headquarters, declaring it had become impossible for him to continue attempting to train crews on the machine. The God, that is so bad. <laughs> like, that is so bad. Disobeying an order usually comes with a penalty. But, like, like, it is so dangerous that even the field commander is just like, yeah, you know what, just don't, don't bother getting in the tank. God, how that was holy crap. I want to see footage of this thing like tipping over now without people getting hurt, of course. Upon hearing all this, French Minister of Armament Albert Thomas immediately cancels all tank <sighs> development and production programs, seeing them now nothing right. more as a waste of war resources, an expensive waste of war resources, war resources that could be made into battleships and wine mm -hmm. and shoes for prostitutes. Both General Moreau and well. Shoes for prostitutes. <laughs> oh gosh. Uh... When Estine write to him and even briefly join forces in an attempt oh, to yeah. convince Thomas to change his mind, a prostitute's shoes are not that important in a war. They can wear the less fancy shoes. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Where did this come from? This is an invention that I swear it has to be straight out of Kansas. I've been to Kansas. You're not missing much, and what you are missing is shit like this. But his decision seems completely set in stone. The French tank project has been a failure and France will produce no more tanks. End of discussion. Really? Until Tomas goes on a diplomatic mission to Russia where the prostitute shoes are very fancy. <laughs> Why are we looking at prostitute shoes? It's not the part of the prostitute I want to get acquainted with. While he's gone, Moreau quietly orders the restart of all production programs, allowing his heavy tank production to go ahead, hoping all of this will fly under the radar. It does not. <laughs> Tomas is furious, and on his return, he immediately banishes Leon to the realm of stale baguettes. And he, he, he fires him. He, he, just, oh. he just fires him, okay? But right. by doing so, he's rid Estine of his biggest rival. Estine is now left to pretty much do what he wants, and he wastes absolutely no time at all. Meanwhile, the development team for this new French heavy tank are almost ready to put together a prototype, but there is a bit of a problem. Oh, the parts designed by Renault have not arrived yet. Renault claims they'll take another three weeks. He's stalling for time, because while all of this has been going on, Renault has been finishing his own tank project. Now that looks like a bit of a problem. <laughs> I fear this is going to cause quite a bit of drama within the politician's circle. Let's watch. Having learned by watching the mistakes from others, Renault's new light tank would need to incorporate a number of radical changes, and for that he's stealing resources intended for the heavy tank project. But in spite of it being pretty much ready for mass production, Tomas still won't greenlight the project. In fact, he's not greenlighting anything. But just then, America joins the war. 
Oh. America's entry into the war is largely a political one. America was on the brink of financial ruin, but the war on Europe has been an advantage. Being an ocean away, America has grown rich of the supplies of raw materials being sold to the Allied powers. But in spite of being officially neutral, President Woodrow Wilson wants to enter the war on the Allied side. For him huh. and millions of other Americans, France is the home of democracy. It was the country that came to America's aid during its war of independence and was officially its first ally. France is also heavily- I know this has nothing to do with the story right now, but um, something's wrong with those horses' tails in debt to the US, and if it were to fall, Wilson fears those repayments would never be made, recreating the conditions for an economic turmoil. There's also a second reason. America has become a melting pot of different nationalities, ideologies, and so on and so forth, uh -huh. and they're not mingling particularly well. Wilson oh. believes that by joining the war, he can unite people against a common enemy, and that will fix all of America's problems. And Absolutely. Nothing, nothing helps fix America's problems. Better than war. Yeah, World War One, World War Two, the Civil War, the Revolutionary War, the War on Drugs, the War on Drag Queens, the War, the War on Leftism, the War, <laughs> the War on Drugs. Did I already mention that? I don't know. Might be the drugs. War just solves all of America's problems. Don't question it. From now on, it will be nothing but people holding hands and singing songs. From there on in. So that doesn't work, but that's a different story. Anyway, <laughs> in an effort to delay their inevitable defeat, Germany starts a program of unrestricted submarine warfare, allowing its U-boats ah. to essentially blockade Britain by sinking any boat supplying it, including the American ones. And uh -oh. this naturally pisses the US off, so now they are part of the war. Britain and France Yay. send envoys to America. Now they have a plan. Rather than send wave after wave of their own men at the enemy, they're going to send wave after wave of American men at the enemy. But to do that, ah. they need to convince the US to send troops. But who is going to command them? France says it should be them because, well, they are the ones leading the Allied force. Britain says it should be them because the language barrier and the food barrier would be somewhat lessened. The Congress ah. isn't sure. But into this fray steps Commander Joffre. Oh, Remember God. him? Oh, baby, he's back. Joffre had been used as a scapegoat for French failures, but with new uh -huh. French command proving equally, if not more, incompetent, Joffre is back on top, and a little revenge plot is boiling in that mind of his. See, Joffre has been sent to America as part of the French envoy. His superiors uh -huh. are expecting him to win favor with the US Congress and convince them to send wave after wave of American men at the uh, German machine guns so that the French will uh, stop deserting and thinking that maybe communism isn't so bad. Joffrey spends four what? weeks on tour. In full view of the press, he's seen waiting patiently for a haircut in the slum district of St. Louis. He meets. Um, I wonder who that is in the lower left center of the screen. He looks familiar for some reason. It's with the French immigrants there, visits the hometown of Abraham Lincoln, and lays a wreath at the tomb of General Lafayette. You Americans, of course, know who he is. You don't need me to explain your history. Lafayette, army commander during the Revolutionary War, helped uh -huh. you win the Battle of Yorktown, considered a national hero. Yep. There's a town in New York named after him. Uh -huh. Ah, you know. Joffrey was quickly becoming a recognized household name. The press loved him. The public loved him. I love him. But this was uh -huh. all just a distraction. Before he'd left to go on tour, Joffrey had addressed the U.S. Congress as an individual and had written a letter recommending the U.S. forces be independently led, beholden to no one, and using their own supply. Now, Congress wasn't stupid. Well, back then they weren't. They were well aware of Operation America Meat Shield, so they went with Joffrey's recommendation. The US would enter World War I as an independent Allied force, under the command of all-American badass General J. Pershing. Now, uh, there's no way that could be a problem. Nope. No siree. No. Bob. No. Actually, I don't know. I don't know too much about history. Why do you think I watched this? <laughs> I'm supposed to be learning. I'm not doing that. Pershing was another who believed in rapid mobile warfare. He'd seen trench warfare played out in Europe and wanted to avoid it as much as possible. He'd also seen reports in the Battle of Cambria, where the British had used mass tank formations to crush barbed wire and suppress machine guns while the infantry followed him behind. Pershing believed that not only could he recreate this tactic, but improve on it. And for that, he wanted tanks that were light and fast and not slow and cumbersome like the British ones. Thankfully for him, once he'd arrived in France, there had once again been a change of leadership. 
The morale of French troops was now at an all-time low. Desertions were frequent, and many troops were now refusing to march blindly into the meat grinders each battlefield had become. They needed someone who could unite them. And there is one man who might do just that. Place your bets now, gentlemen. Who's it going to be? Leave your answer in the comments. It's decided that all Allied forces should be placed under a central commander. And that commander is Philippe Bataan. Bam. Bataan was a national hero. How many of you are wrong? All of you owe me money now. Unlike other French commanders who favored the restrictions of the class system, keeping the peasants where they are and out of my bloody wine shack. Oh, disgusting. The working class. Why am I doing a British accent? These people are French. Mm -hmm. Mon is the working class. Ugh, disgusting. My wine is superior. Your wine tastes like toilet water. Something, something like that. I, I don't <laughs> know. I'll replace that line later. Perfectly sober. Unlike other French commanders who favored the restrictions of the class system, Patan frequently visited the frontline trenches. He handed out cigarettes, drank the same wine, ate the same stew as the common soldier. The French saw him as an inspiration, a people's man. And as luck would have it, he too was in favor of faster, lighter tanks. He was also a good friend with Estine, and did not waste time placing him in charge of all tank production in France. Nice. But that wasn't to be the end of it. The public and those dirty politicians still favored the heavy tank ideology, and what was worse, Pershing had ordered a number of Renault's new light tanks to form the backbone of America's first tank divisions. With Renault seeing dollar signs and the French politicians wasting time and resources on giant super tanks, Estine feared that the light tank he'd always dreamed of would be sold off to the Americans, and all French tank production would instead focus on delivering a single big dumb tank. Alright, so I'm with you so far. So the question is now what to actually do about that. Uh, kill the Americans? No, because then I wouldn't be born. Uh, say screw the public and po politicians and just make a bunch of light tanks and win the war for yourself. Bam, got it. Use light tanks to kill Hitler. I'm all on board. And Steen was not happy, but he had a plan. Oh, wait, this is World War One. <laughs> My bad. In a conversation with Bataan, he highlighted the importance of getting tanks onto the battlefield quickly, and how Renault's tank was ready to go, versus a prototype that could still take months, perhaps even years, to complete. Bataan sees Estine's point, but the situation has become somewhat more political. The public and the politicians are now starting to ask questions on why this new French super heavy tank was being delayed for so long. And what's because... worse, America had just offered 400 of the new tanks being designed in a joint project with Britain if France could at least just try to make an effort to getting at least one of their tanks ready. That would mean that this new war-winning weapon would be largely a British weapon, and France would get left behind. So, uh, oh. the anti-tank minister to Mars, and in comes pro-tank Louis Suchere. God, that's a throwback. Oh my gosh, I, I'm going to watch so much Team Four Star after this. I've also been kind of just wanting to go through Dragon Ball Z. Not, not DBZ abridged, the actual Dragon Ball Z. Well, the problem is I don't have anywhere to play the, the, the ones I have. <laughs> My life is hard. Julie green lights both projects. Renault's new tank rolls off the production line at speed. The Renault Shard Assault Mark 18, better known by its post-war American codename, French Tank Model 1917, or FT-17. The first tank with a... F M1917. Oh my god, that reminds me... Oh my god. It's all come full circle, guys. Okay, so here lately, this song has been in my head, and I've been wondering what the hell M1917 could possibly mean. And boom, boom, this right here, this is it. Uh, for those of you who are on the Discord, I'm actually going to share this to the Discord. Give me one second. First tank with a fully rotating turret, and it is amazing. It In looks spite amazing. Of being smaller and less impressive than previous tanks, the lightweight and speedy design of the FT-17 means more of them quickly reach the opposite side and overwhelm the German defenses. The yes. speed of the French advance is staggering. But that heavy tank is still looming in the background, and questions on its existence are starting to be asked. Lodger has greenlit okay. the project, and Renault, who had been trying to ignore it, finally relents and produces oh, the on. engines oh, and gearboxes required. Tan and Estine okay. are not happy. Ugh. They have the tank they want, and are desperately trying to push out as many as they can in time for a major planned offensive. Oh, for that, Renault needs all the steel he can get, and adding this 30-ton monster to the production line will slow down that supply. That's a massive problem. Just produce these tanks. Stop worrying about the big tank. 
Just lie to the public. You're politicians, that's what you do. So they do as all good Frenchmen do. Delay production. Esteen demands a number of major changes and then selects the largest and most impractical design for mass production, forcing the designers to return to the drawing board. Patan then demands that 400 be ready as quickly as possible, which is an impossibility. This creates a heated argument among the political leaders and the project becomes bogged down in delays. And by November Yay. 1918, peace breaks out. A ceasefire comes into effect on the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month, effectively ending the First World War. Though a treaty of peace will not be signed until the following year, the weird multicultural orgy of murder that is the First World War is effectively over. French heavy tank production is therefore cancelled. But there is still a lot of political pressure on the project to be finished. I mean, after all, it has been pretty costly. The newspapers have been hyping the project up to the public, and now we have all these factories that aren't really doing anything. So really, really, we should finish it. Esteen sighs dramatically. <laughs> he is French, after all. And I yes, that would put a lot of people out of work right away if you just said, no, we're not going to do that. And then you have mobs coming after you, which is not the thing you really want when you're in politics. So, yeah, my reaction would definitely be to finish it. But give everyone a free bottle of wine. You know, as kind of a thank you for making this incredibly useless project now. Well, at least useless right now. It'll be useful in the future, I'm assuming. After a lot of Frenching back and forth, he finally agrees to a limited production run of 10 heavy tanks. Work begins. Okay. And being France, work begins slowly. Peaks mm. around 2 p.m. and then everyone takes their breaks and doesn't come back until the following day. But. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I suddenly want to move to France. It seems like the working conditions are way better than here in the U.S. Eventually, they do finish them. And while the FT-17 is probably rather unfairly remembered as the world's first modern tank, it will be this new tank, the FCM Char d'Assault de Grand Modèle, known more commonly as the Char 2C, that will carry the innovations of all future modern tanks. It is the nice. first tank to feature a three-man turret with a dedicated loader, a gunner, a commander acting as spotter. It will feature a 75mm gun capable of firing both high explosive and armor-piercing rounds, as well as a coaxial machine gun running parallel to the main gun, two-way radio communication between the crew, as well as a set of that heavy, wide metal tracks, all things that would become standard in the Second World War. The Char 2C was the only super tank designed to become fully operational, and out of all the proposed designs, it was probably the most practical and the most modern. It would have a final crew of 12 and be one of the first non-specialist tanks to feature a radio as standard with a dedicated radio operator. Unfortunately, heralded by Esteen and people like him, French tank philosophy would follow the footsteps of the F-17, which honestly I can't blame them for. The mm -hmm. FTC 17 proved to be World War I's most successful tank. It would go on to become the first tank of Japan, the US, the Soviet Union, uh, Finland, Estonia, Lithuania, Yugoslavia, Belgium, Czechoslovakia, Switzerland, the Netherlands, Greece, Sweden, and even Brazil. Holy so it was crap. only natural that French designers would choose to follow in the footsteps of their most successful tank, not the weird sister that no one wanted. Mm -hmm. So Second World War French tanks like the Air 35 and the D1 would be built to be small, lightweight, and have a one-man turret with a frontal plate heavily up armor to try and combat the rising advance of the anti-tank gun. Our good friends at Samoy, who were responsible for the Schneider, redeemed themselves with the S-35, one of France's most successful tanks of the period, though highly underrated given the shadow it's living in. The only tank which would come close to the technical innovations of the 2C would be the Char G1, an unfinished prototype for a medium tank which featured turret stabilization, a semi-automatic gun loader, and an optical rangefinder, all things that were not really common on tanks until late model M4 Shermans. Of course, so that was a lot of stuff. I barely caught ha most of it, so it's all lost on me. Sorry, in one ear, out the other. My bad. I should have been paying attention, but it's that ADHD thing that's happening. All I know is Big Guy got funded. It got finished. <clears throat> it is massive. It was the model plan for a lot of different tanks. The faster, lighter one, the M1917, I'm assuming, was greenlit and mass-produced, and a bunch of different countries bought them, including us in the U.S. And then it also had a little sister. And then there's another, I'm assuming another one. Or I could be mistaken about that, and my brain's just all over the place. Let's find out. None of these would be finished by the time France fell, though once oh. France was liberated, it was strongly considered restarting the project to create a fully independent French armored division. However, oh. by then, America was pumping out Shermans by the shipload, so there wasn't really much point. So in Yeah, those. Damned Americans. They're real bastards, you know. 
Instead, it was decided that France would attempt to produce a tank for the then unexploited heavy tank market, the ARL 44. So in an ultimate twist of irony, France's first tank since its liberation would be a heavy tank. Huh. Which honestly wasn't that great, though considering the French had to scavenge for paper to draw plans on, they did a pretty decent job. But what happened to the 10 Char 2 Cs? What is this mystery I keep alluding to? Well, after the First World War and having been lumbered with all these behemoth tanks, France wasn't particularly sure what to do with them. FCM fiddled around with the tanks until about 1923 when France semi-retired them, keeping two in a battle-ready state while the others remained in the shed. It wouldn't be until World War II when all 10 tanks were reactivated and pressed into service, forming their oh. own unique division, the 51st, though their use never really ranged beyond taking propaganda films. And by this point, the tanks were considered hopelessly outdated being large, slow, and with only 40 millimeters of armor protection, and yet they were oddly capable. All 10 tanks had radios, and an interlink communication with a central command tank having a dedicated commander capable of directing the whole unit. This was at a time when radios and French tanks were still relatively uncommon. That thing, yeah. Yeah, definitely more than capable. Honestly, if you were to just, like, storm a city, it would be yours at that time. I mean, compared to today's tanks, probably definitely a bit outdated, but... Is that that thing solid? That thing solid. I I kind of want one. I want one. I want one. And flak signals were still in use. A modernization program had begun in hopes of carving out some use for these tanks. Uh, the command tank Lorraine was up armored from 40 to 90 millimeters, making it the single most powerful tank in existence at the time. If you only consider armor and weight as power. But it was to no avail. After the Germans broke through French defences, the decision was made to move the tanks to the south of France to prevent them from being captured. They were loaded onto a train and began a long journey south, but a burning fuel train blocked their path. Oh. And after a lot of Frenching, the decision was made to detonate the sabotage charges inside the tanks, destroying them. The Germans would fight- That's very unfortunate. <laughs> That's a lot of big equipment that you could have used. Ah, oh, that's so sad. But not as sad as uh, America missing 32 nukes. Find them a few days later as burning wrecks. FCM would attempt to build several more heavy tanks, including an attempted commission for a 600 ton tank capable of wielding a battleship turret. Yeah, that never went anywhere. Yeah, I, mean, I can never, imagine. None of these ideas would ever leave the prototype stage, save for the FCM F1, a dual turreted 139 ton monster truck of a tank, which was rush ordered in 1940. Construction began, but was never completed. Anyway, oh, that's all sad. for me. Go away. That's sad. They had a lot of great ideas, and none of them left the drawing board, except for, you know, <laughs> well, there's that one that was really bad. The, the one with the battleship turret. Yeah, no way, no how. Maybe a tank that fires lasers instead. That would have been more feasible at the time. Oh, no, wait, the mystery. Right, right, sorry, sorry. Oh, so yeah. as it turns out, not all Char 2 Cs were destroyed. Tank oh, number cool. 99, Champagne, survived. Its charges failed to detonate, so when the German... A French tank named Champagne. <sighs> okay. Germans found her, she was in pristine condition. She was taken back to Berlin as a war trophy, and some debate exists as to where it was displayed. I mean, some sources claim it was positioned right outside the Reichstag, others, which are more likely correct, positioned it on Museum Island along with the two Mark V tanks I mentioned a few videos ago, alongside a T-35 captured from the Russians. If or not the Char 2C was reactivated and used remains a subject of debate. Not a huge amount of debate, I mean, there's, there's no evidence for it. But considering one of Germany's most effective weapons during the battle was two children, an artillery shell, and a hammer, it isn't really much of a stretch to think it would have seen action. Either way, the tank right. was still there in 1945 when the Russians attacked the city, uh, though by now it had been very damaged. Berliners reported they could still see the tank until about 1948, when it vanished. And this is the mystery. Ooh. Mysteries. I love mysteries. What happened to Champagne? Well, there are two theories. The first and most probable was that it shared the same fate as the two Mark Vs. Russia famously stripped the city of everything it could get its hands on, including vehicles, but tanks were not something it was particularly after. Images of the famous Berlin scrapyard shows discarded German heavy tanks such as Panthers, Tigers, and even King Tigers. The two Mark Vs uh. shared a similar fate. In spite of both these tanks originally being Russian war trophies captured by the Germans when Odessa fell, the Soviets didn't mm. feel the need to reclaim them, and they were shortly after. Sad. However, there is evidence of this, photographs of them being taken away, as, as well as a registry. I mean, the Soviets loved records. Thus, there are records of the Mark Vs being scrapped, yet nothing exists for Champagne. Enter Theory 2. Uh, this is the most popular theory. The reason no documents exist is because the tank was one of many vehicles scooped up and transferred to Koblinka, at a time a secret testing range for vehicles, now a museum, and whose records are still largely sealed, though most of its exhibits have now been moved to the new Patriotic Park open 
open air museum, which allegedly has a miniature Reichstag for children to storm, which I fucking love, by the way. What the fuck? Parts of Gablinka were never open to the public, including the famous Hangar 14, which was patrolled by armored guards. It is a popular well. theory that this is where Russia keeps its secret prototypes, or the more modern vehicles it has captured from various NATO allied nations it won't admit to having. This sounds a whole lot like Area 51, where we keep the, you know, secret space alien technology that we don't want anyone else to know about. People also believe this is where they are keeping champagne. Now, okay, that's probably true. Well within the scope of possibility, but why? What exactly does Russia have to gain by secretly goblin hoarding a century-old tank? Does champagne hold some dark secret? Does the Germans install her with some advanced secret Nazi technology that everyone keeps banging on about? Well, the answer actually may be a bit more mundane than you think it is. Hmm. The Blinka has something which it holds as a matter of pride. The answer might very well be, that's where Hitler kept his gold. It's, it's, on, it's on the champagne. Hitler kept his gold in the champagne. For what reason, I do not know. It's also where Hitler's been living this entire time. He never died. My sources are, trust me, bro. Makes it unique from all other tank museums in that it does not show wrecks. All the tanks, all of them, are displayed in their original intended conditions, fully restored by the dedicated team of engineers. Now, Koblinka is not private. It is still considered an active military base and receives huh. money from the government. The Russian government has set priorities on what funds are allocated and for what reason. And since every few months someone with a metal detector digs up yet another T-34, Koblinka has a rather long backlog of either Russian tanks to restore for the museum or for private collections. And since allocation oh. of funds to restore Russian tanks takes priority for foreign vehicles, there is simply not enough time, nor funds, to fully restore a gigantic old French tank no one's even really heard of, nor cares about. Especially since, given the condition it's probably in, it would take years and millions of dollars to bring back up to museum quality. Oh. And the most annoying thing is, as time moves on, the likelihood of it actually ever being restored, or even being at Kablinka, steadily decreases. And yes, I, I have called to ask, but you would not tell me even when I offered to buy it. <laughs> How much would you pay to buy a tank? How much does a tank cost? Like, retail. How much? I don't want to know. Never mind. Don't answer that question. I'm not looking it up either. Hello. Hi. I'm quite drunk. <laughs> and I'm going to explain why in a second. Okay, mm -hmm. so I'm adding this part on at the end because, well, firstly, my microphone is working again. Thank fuck for that. But mm -hmm. because this final part was going to introduce a third theory. And that third theory is my own personal theory. I was going to okay. go on and explain about how all the other theories generally don't make any sense. About how a lot of the information regarding those theories are basically woozles. Just various websites repeating the same information over and over and over again, which largely comes from one misquoted source. And I was going to go over all the work that I'd done trying to find the Shar to see and the conclusion of where I thought it was. It was going to be a very behind the scenes look at the kind of stuff that I do all day. Unfortunately, for reasons beyond my understanding, YouTube considered this part of the video a breach of community standards. Thanks, YouTube. This is why content creators have such a hard time on here. The karaoke I do at the end of each video. I'm sorry to say I'm not going to be doing those anymore. I, I, Okay. I, I enjoy doing them. I, I love doing them. People seem to really find them funny, but I think we all knew that this was coming at some point. YouTube has once again decided that me singing these songs are a violation of copyright and are considered a cover song, not a parody, which means half my income, which, you know, isn't a lot, by the way, will now be sent off to these multi-mega billionaire record labels who plead poverty but refuse to give themselves the slightest pay cut. So, a Patreon may be coming out soon. Turns out this is necessary to do, to beg people for money. And I'm just going to get over my hatred of having to ask people for money. So yeah, that's a thing. Yeah, speaking of which, uh, I do have a Patreon too, uh, by the way, down in the description. If you like what I do, uh, you should... Definitely think about signing up for that. I'm working on getting YouTube uh, memberships active. Right now, we're working on um, membership badges and emojis because I promised that, and that's going to be part of it. So once we get that figured out, then we'll start rolling that program out. But until then, yeah, my Patreon will be linked in the description below if you are currently a member of the cult and uh, wish to pay your tithe. <laughs> or you could just send me a one-time offering in the form of the super thanks. If you're new to the channel, subscribe and become a member of the meme cult, meme cult and do all that same stuff. Or if you're not subscribed, become a member of the meme cult anyway. <laughs> I'll just check out the link in the description below where you can recommend me more stuff. This was recommended in the comments section, which works too, but uh, I'd rather just see people actually using the link in the description below to Discord 
go over there, go to the Vlad Reacts channel, and leave your suggestions there. Just uh, be aware of like what the community guidelines are for that. But for now, thank you guys so much for watching. If you enjoyed it, feel free to show me some love down below by hitting the like button. And don't forget to check out the annotations for more videos. Now, I'll see you in the next video.